I'm Elizabeth Trowin, a fellow here at RPE, and I'm joined by Shashank Samala, the CEO of Heirloom. We are here to have a conversation about Heirloom's carbon removal technology and to discuss how RPE's Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, funding has helped Heirloom achieve its research and development goals. Heirloom was awarded SBIR funding in 2021 through RPE's SEED program. SEED stands for Supporting Entrepreneurial Energy Discoveries and is one of RPE's exploratory topics. Welcome to Shank. Let's dive in. Uh, so we'll start, uh, I'll start by asking, what is the importance and potential impact of carbon dioxide removal or CDR technologies? And how does your technology differ from other CDR methods? Thanks so much, Elizabeth. So I would answer that in two ways. One is carbon removal helps remove legacy emissions. So one, you know, we put out a couple of trillion tons of CO2 in the air in the last couple of hundred years, you know, the start of the industrial revolution and that which has really cost the the CO2 parts per million to go up from 280 to now, you know, 415. So all of the CO2 that's already in the air, which is contributing to climate change, there is no technology that exists uh, in decarbonization that deals with that problem. We need to remove the CO2 that's already in the air. It's causing um, radiative forcing, which, which causes increases in temperature and, and many other disasters. So carbon removal is the only way to deal with the legacy emissions. The second one is addressing hard to abate emissions. So when you think about where emissions come from, right, it's, it's electricity, it's, you know, transportation, aviation, shipping, agriculture, and manufacturing. So if you look at all these sectors, and there are some of them that are you know, there, there's existing technologies to address them. So solar and wind and, and, and electric vehicles for passenger, uh, for, for small sedan transportation. But then when you look at, you know, the, the hard to abate sectors, which are cement uh, manufacturing, steel production, aviation, um, shipping, agriculture, these, all these, all these sectors um, have emissions that are just incredibly like technologies that are fairly nascent or it's very expensive to reduce carbon and decarbonize. So, you know, we need to do everything possible to, to, to reduce emissions in these sectors. But in addition to doing that, we need to complement that by removing carbon out of the air. At a high level, how does heirloom technology work? Heirloom technology leverages something called carbon mineralization. So carbon mineralization is really about using naturally available rocks. Um, rocks which have a natural propensity to capture CO2 out of the air and basically give them superpowers to capture even more CO2 and even faster. Um, so as you will see in this picture, you know, these are rocks that you probably have seen before, you know, calcium carbonates, magnesium carbonates, limestone. There's trillions of tons of CO2 that was sequestered in these rocks over geological timeframes. Um, even though it's a large carbon sink, it's kind of slow at capturing CO2. So what we do is essentially create something called an heirloom looping process, uh, which essentially starts with these minerals. And the first thing we do with these minerals is we put them in an electric kiln, which thermally decomposes the mineral into an oxide, calcium oxide or magnesium oxide, and CO2. Um, so it does two things. One is break this up. And the other thing is it produces an oxide coming out of the kiln to be very reactive with CO2, because basically, you know, this oxide wants to be with CO2 uh, to be stable. And because you put in some energy to break that bond, this oxide is just looking for CO2 to marry, right? Like it, that's what it wants to be. So, you know, if you just put this on your desk, it starts reacting with CO2 in the air. Uh, it pulls in CO2 molecules. So Problem is it's, it's slow. And what we've done is essentially make this process a lot, lot faster. Um, you know, something that would take maybe a year or more, we've uh, brought it down to days. And, you know, how we do that is, is, is essentially where a lot of IP comes from and some of what RE uh, helped fund. And that acceleration of CO2 uptake from the air, completely passive, no energy, uh, no extra airflow, um, is, is really the crux to, to what we do. Um, and after the oxide captures the CO2, it becomes a carbonate, which is exactly what you started with. So you can put it back into the kiln and run this process over and over again. 
Um, so you get to recycle the carbonate instead of having to mine every time, you know, you can recycle this over and over again, use the oxide as a sponge to, to ca capture CO2 from the air. So how does heirloom technology differ from other CDR methods? What's the, the main benefit of heirloom technology? It's different in three ways. One is that, you know, we're part of this sort of a DAC 2.0 revolution uh, with indirect recapture where, you know, one of the elements I think in DAC 2.0 is, is using passive uh, air capture. Uh, instead of using energy flow and uh, big fans that blow a bunch of air through, you know, custom sorbents, custom filters, uh, we try to not use fans because it's cheaper not having that extra capex and not having the energy. And energy is is your enemy when it comes to capturing CO2. You want to minimize energy as, as much as possible. So essentially, you know, we, we remove that. It's a, it's a passive capture process. Um, secondly, it's, it's, a, it's incredibly modular. Um, so our contactors are basically kind of look like racks. Uh, there are a bunch of trays. Um, these trays have oxides in them that um, passively capture CO2, and then these trays are stacked. And each rack is a module. And you can basically scale up uh, or scale down um, in, a, in a modular way, which allows you to you know, use um, traditional manufacturing technologies to, and to, to get it up to scale, decrease cost, and get the learning curve uh, really steep. Um, so, so modularity is incredibly important, incredibly important for learning curve, cost curves, and also for scalability. Number three, um, the difference is really using fairly off the shelf existing supply chain and existing technologies to do what we're doing. You know, we're using carbonates. We're not building our own sorbents or filters, partly because, you know, we think there's a whole supply chain and uh, you have to build for custom sorbents. And we are like, let's, let's start with some, what nature gives us and just give it superpowers and make it just good enough to get it to the cost that it needs to. What has it been like to work with RPE as a small business and how has the RPE SBIR grant helped you achieve your goals? It's really great for early stages, retiring uh, early stage technical risk. Um, and in those stages, venture becomes fairly expensive. And, you know, I think personally, even though it's a lot of work to get that funding, um, there's, you know, there's, Big questionnaires and big, uh, uh, lots of things to 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 fill out. You know those questions do help you think through technical and commercialization questions that, uh, in a very very deep way, that you know some other pathways don't. You know, in many ways, we actually look at the application process as a way to play, clarify our own thinking about what we want to do with the funding, where we want to go for commercialization and where are our biggest technical risks are. And even though it may seem like a lot of work, um, the, you know, it helped clarifies. Now, obviously the funding itself could fund things that are sort of a bit out there that other folks may not understand, but RPE folks, because they're very technically sound um, and, uh, and probably also know the domain of your technology will more likely to be funding that type of high impact, but high risk technology. What is your vision for the future of heirloom? Where do you see heirloom in five to 10 years? We, we would want to be removing a billion tons of CO2 from the air per year by 2035. Um, you know, the reason we do this is because we think that climate change negatively impacts the world's most vulnerable people, uh, people who had little to do with it to start. Um, and you know, we think that's deeply unfair. So I think the motivation for what we work on is, is one of equity. Um, and we think that uh, heirloom could be the equalizer of opportunities. So where do we want to see ourselves five to 10 years from now? It's you know, making it's two, really two things, cost and scale. Um, we want to bring the cost down below 100 bucks a ton towards 50 bucks a ton. And we want to make massive progress towards there. Um, and, and what we can do in the meantime is basically increase our learning rate, uh, increase our rate of learning uh, to come down that cost curve. And number two is being able to deploy uh, a meaningful amount, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the tens of millions of tons in that uh, uh, five to ten year time frame. And cost is really, you know, in many ways, the cost and deployment, those are really tied together. You know, we really believe that cost is a function of deployment. 
the more you deploy, the cheaper it gets. Um, and you know, because design, manufacturing, automation, a lot of scale, um, all of them ladder up to reducing cost. Um, so yeah, that's probably how we see ourselves in the next five to 10 years. Thanks so much, Shashank, for joining us today. Uh, it's been great to talk with you about Heirloom and uh, your CDR technology. Thanks again. Thank you.